practical action. Daniel Finamore is Associate Director Exhibition and the Russell W. Knight Curator of Maritime Art and History at the Peabody Essex Museum. He has organized over 15 exhibitions on an international range of maritime subjects. He was curator for Ocean Liners, Glamour, Speed and Style, which appeared at the Victorian and Albert Museum in London and as the inaugural exhibition at the new V&A Museum in Dundee in Scotland. Finamore has conducted archaeological field research from Sable Island to Belize, some of which contributed toward the groundbreaking exhibition and book Fiery Pool, the Mayan at the Mythic Sea. He has written over 40 articles and chapters for academic and popular publication and is the author or editor of six books, including Maritime History as World History and, most recently, the companion publication for the exhibition in American Waters, The Sea in American Painting. Welcome, Dan. So first of all, I need to um, apologize that some of you at, on the program, it did for a while carry the name Linda Hardigan, who is the director of the Peabody Essex, who had hoped to be here uh, with us all, but uh, her schedule precluded it, and I know that some of you would like to meet her. She was very excited about the prospect of engaging with this group, but it didn't work out this time, so hopefully in the near future. <clears throat> but for those of you unfamiliar with the Peabody Essex Museum, um, this is the facade of our main building that you see the East Indian Marine Hall in the center, built in 1825. On the left is most of our um, traditional exhibition galleries. On the right, you can see our new wing that opened in 2019. Uh, but since this is a session about science, did that change already? Oh, no, I opened it back. Okay, here we are. Um, it's, and about the environment, perhaps uh, it's more appropriate that I open with the slide with all the butterflies, which maybe I'll get back to, or maybe, there we are. Oh, no, now I'm going back, forth, back, this way? Because earlier today I heard I was supposed to point that way. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so. Um, at all. Right here. Three, two, one. Because there are more than one green button on this thing, I'll point out. Anyway, so, so the museum that we know today as the Peabody Essex Museum has a long and a variegated history of involves transformation and merger going back to 1799. It was founded by sea captains and, you know, it's always, um, maritime's always been at the core of, of much of what we do, um, including sort of intensive engagement with navigational and oceanographic studies. Uh, during the, much of the later 19th century, the museum was transformed into an academy of science, an academy of natural science, and a staff um, with specialties such as the curator of crustacea. Um, and my favorite was the curator of mycology, um, which was a collection that would fit in your shirt pocket, I think. But um, the museum was well known for a summer school in the 1870s that um, allowed for some pretty cross-disciplinary studies of science and so on. Um, today, we can really uh, engage with um, a number of different disciplines without worrying too much about how we classify them and how others classify the experience that they have uh, within the museum. The science school produced some science educators, some pretty prominent people way back then. Uh, but today, we're much more of a visitor-centered museum, of course. Uh, and uh, not so much one dedicated to the primary research uh, in the sciences, um, but it's really one that's intended to sort of explicitly uh, to engage people by meeting them where they are and where they come from into the museum. Is it science? Is it art? Is it history? Is it something else? Um, can we provide interesting uh, uh, experiences that produce lasting memories and perhaps even influence people in an environmentally sound direction and doing so without soundingly uh, overly opinionated or didactic, I think is, um, is, is a part of our approach. Um, in 2020, we launched what we call the Climate and Environment Initiative, which is a constellation of projects that focus on um, our changing relationship to the natural world, but specifically, they're designed to encourage uh, reflection uh, and to inspire conversation among visitors and to spark action. 
So we address topics like sustainable practice and environmental justice, coastal vulnerability, um, and we do so through gallery experiences uh, with programming, publishing, uh, physical, and also digital media. But rather than leaning into hypotheses uh, and facts as scientific studies, uh, each project offers sort of a, a different, a slightly different visual lens on the relationship to the environment. Uh, and also, while, while offering bridges to one, from one exhibition to the other for a continued kind of continuity of experience at the museum, which enforces sort of the compatible thematic messaging of what the museum is and what we're actually providing uh, in a visit to the museum over the course of time, or multiple visits over the course of time. So they don't really conform uh, to a history museum or a science museum paradigm, but I leave it to you to decide what they should be classified as. So, you will note, as I run through some of these, um, these projects are not directly maritime uh, per se, but if, uh, as we learned yesterday, there is really only one interconnected ocean, I would argue that there really is only one interconnected environment. So uh, now I'd like to quickly run through some of these to show you how each project has been designed to engage people with different interests and different learning styles in the hope that if one approach doesn't connect, uh, perhaps another one does. So the first, which was organized sort of in the, the dead of COVID in the summer of 2020, um, Alexis Rockman uh, shipwrecks. He's a contemporary painter of large scale works. Uh, he's known for his fantastical paintings that tackle ecological issues, climate change, species extinction. Um, as my friends at Mystic Seaport will attest, um, he is not shy about his work and his opinions. Uh, and he doesn't create mysterious images with inscrutable messaging, as many contemporary artists do today. Uh, rather, he uh, creates dramatic depictions of historic shipwrecks and other ecological after effects of, that symbolize the impact of migration, of goods, and of people, plants and animals, um, that, that, that the impact that that has had on our planet. So we installed this show, as I say, in the dark days, and there wasn't an enormous um, turnout, but we were very lucky to have had an enormous gallery. Our, our large uh, East India Marine Hall uh, was available to install very large paintings. And I will point out to Eric that um, not even these pictures of a kraken in a, um, uh, with, with a Viking ship and some other unidentified sea species rising over the horizon um, were enough to scare the kids. So it's cool. This painting uh, features animals that represent uh, various disease vectors that are associated with human transport and consumption. There's a pangolin that you can see there sort of in the center. There's a flying fox and a civet uh, and so on, along with a, a nice um, and probably pretty recognizable reference to human mortality floating up there above it all. And um, this is the wreck of the brig Helen, which some of you will undoubtedly have heard of. Uh, which was the ship that Alfred Russell Wallace uh, booked his passage home on from South America when he was returning uh, with all of his specimens he had collected of several years um, in, this, in the, uh, the, the Amazon and, and around there. Um, rather than focusing on the human tragedy of the disaster at sea and the fire that destroyed all of uh, the people on board, as you can see in the background, jumping off of the bowsprit, and all of those uh, collections that would have uh, contributed to his understanding of nature, the story focuses really on the uh, animal's perspective of the live specimens that uh, were aboard in that great, great disaster. Uh, climate Action, Inspiring Change, is now up in our family-oriented art and nature center. This show leverages sort of participation uh, and, and personal creativity. Uh, in a more sort of directly science-oriented uh, exhibition, and it's intended to raise awareness about the, the underlying issues of climate change and focusing on known solutions, uh, including indigenous practices to foster action, rather than being a heavy weight uh, to tell us that it's well beyond our individual capabilities to do something about, to engage people right there in the galleries, so to learn more. Uh, it brings together contemporary art and hands-on experiences and a lot of work by youth artists as well. Um, and the goal there is to sort of to teach us, you know, how to move beyond these feelings of fear and these feelings of helplessness and to make informed choices and take positive steps forward 
I think I've got a slide here where that shows, yeah, a couple of guys at the opening here, they're learning about, you know, where their food comes from and the environmental impact of, and the carbon footprint for, of transporting it. So my recent favorite is the great animal orchestra, Bernie Krause and United Visual Artists, uh, which we featured this spring and into early summer. Um, so this installation presented an immersive audiovisual experience that celebrates the planet's rich biodiversity. Uh, Bernie Krause is a musician and a soundscape ecologist who's been around for many years. You, some of you no doubt have heard of him. Um, he, found it, um, he found in the 1960s that animal vocalizations in the environments that he went to in the natural world um, can be viewed as akin to uh, a musical harmony and orchestral orchestration. Uh, and he created animated soundscapes uh, that, that these recordings, you know, he views them, this is revealing like within any ecosystem there is a great animal orchestra. And so he's been recording them since the 60s, as I say, but his project uh, that we installed here was commissioned in 2016 by the Cartier Foundation for Contemporary Art, uh, and it's now part of their permanent collection. Uh, and is a very strange and wonderful kind of experience that had quite a bit that we did not ex we did not expect uh, some of the uh, responses to. So it's a single gallery space. There are seven different environments that have been sampled, and there's a visualization as, that you can see in here that runs through. Each of the environments is sampled for three to seven minutes, totaling about 35 minutes of running time. Some of them are different colors, as you can see. And then you can see some words all the way in the upper left is telling you where uh, this has been recorded. And then as noises and sounds appear, some identification of the individual species that are part of the orchestra. So we expected people to come and go at will uh, and to wander in and then wander out. And we quickly found out that visitors really wanted to stay for the entire 35 minutes. We did what I always love to do and really shake the registrars to their core. We brought water into the gallery. It's just love it. And so uh, we brought in a bunch of seating because people really did want to stay there for much longer than I had uh, anticipated at least. In a, an exhibition that's up currently called Down to the Bone, two artists, uh, New Yorker cartoonist Edward Corrin uh, and nature photographer Steve Gorman, who live in the same part of Vermont, they decided to come together to express uh, their two very different but mutually reinforcing visions of the environmental sort of present and future. So they paired their works uh, to emphasize their message and to respond to the consequences of destabilizing the natural environment. And so Gorman's photographs of polar bears, um, they, you know, they've congregated around the Inupiat community of Kaktovik in Alaska, um, where they go in what is now a new ice-free season for them and to find food among the discarded um, whale bones from the Inupiat hunt. Um, the bears are climate refugees, and the finding um, of food now requires them to get um, dangerously close to the world of humans, it's fair to say. Um, Gorman describes himself as a dramatist of the Anthropocene. Uh, Ed Corrin, on the other hand, he creates drawings of bemused and bewildered creatures wandering in landscapes of ruin. Um, so they're humorous at first glance. Uh, some of you will recognize them instantly for years of seeing them in, in the New Yorker magazine. Um, but ultimately, they convey a sadness and a sense of loss that's pretty direct and poignant. Um, this one on the, on the right here of Corrin's is called Thinking About Extinction. Um, so you know, th this show is up currently, so I, it's hard to make, make summary conclusions about it and its success, but I find it interesting that one artist is completely direct uh, and on message with his images, while the other sort of appeals by giving human traits to extinct animals and imaginary creatures. Um, they both arouse emotion in viewers, um, but from very different perspectives, and they both certainly uh, foster a look inward uh, by visitors to um, think differently about their own environments. So perhaps um, one of our most abstract references to climate change took place this past spring um, when an artist named Constantine Demopoulos painted trees around the museum campus blue. Uh, part performance art, uh, part ephemeral public installation. Um, some of the trees were colored with this biologically safe watercolor uh, to focus attention on the growing threat of deforestation. 
it, it isn't paint per se, but just some pigment that will wear off um, over the course of a season or two, or maybe three. Um, Demopolis is a, is a social and environmental artist, and he's created these installations around the globe. So some of you might have seen them, uh, including places, other places in the US and in Canada, uh, as well as Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, Europe. Um, one of the things I've enjoyed about this installation is, is its abstractness, right? Uh, and it's sort of the extremely varied public response and the way it reaches people who live in Salem and around who don't necessarily walk into the museum. Uh, who walked down the main drag of, of Essex Street in Salem, and you know the guy cuts my hair, for instance, has never been into the museum. He has no interest in coming into the museum. He's like, "What's up with the blue trees?" I say, "It worked, good." <laughs> but really, um, it, it's really interesting to listen to the random residents and the ra random tourists who walk by and say this, because outdoor art really reaches um, a wider cross section of the public than other forms, especially uh, in the city. You know, you spend five minutes standing among these trees and you hear lots of passerbys and comments and they'll say things like, well, why are the trees blue? And I've come to realize it really doesn't matter like how big that sign is on the museum wall that says, why are these trees blue, right? <laughs> so all that about whether people read labels or not comes home to roost, I think it's fair to say. So this is the sort of project that really markets itself. It's consummately Instagrammable, of course. Um, but we also, you know, we have loads of local discussions on social media, um, positive and negative, and I've chosen to embrace it all, right? Because um, there's been tons of social media about how we're killing these trees. And if we're not killing these trees, certainly we're killing the bugs that live on those trees, right? And for sure, you know, and basically the museum is this hideous, callous behemoth in the middle of town that's just insensitive to the environment. But it gets them talking, what else can I say, right? Um, we got their attention and maybe a little bit of their curiosity. So to close, I think a few personal insights are warranted here, and these are very personal ones and things that I am thinking about more in terms of, of exhibition planning than about individual uh, curatorial um, projects. And, and you know, it's sort of a cautionary, predictive kind of look into the future. You know, and although we are all maritime museums, um, each of our institutions have developed unique approaches to our subjects. Uh, people love and they support specific maritime museums for very specific and personal reasons. And it has a lot to do with individual identities that as museums, you know, we have crafted over the course of time, sometimes a very long time. So we've seen incredible polarization in the world, of course, in recent times, and with the environment becoming a serious political pawn. So as a point of strategy, I'm thinking about two things. So one, will we be more effective at elevating the conversation about climate change if we don't appear to be taking a very strong political stance, artists will express what they will, and science presents facts. But as the platform for those subjects, where should we stand? How should we be inviting? And to the extent of that, I really just mean in an ex exhibition title. How do we get people in the door, no matter where they stand on the issue, and then deliver what we have to deliver? Um, and, and so I've been talking a bit about our, our titling. Uh, as a way of being consummately inviting, more inviting that way. And my second point relates to the unique qualities that each of our museums have. You know, if every one of us is chasing a, the same goal, how does the public differentiate between us? And what do we risk by creating sort of a generic experience across maritime museums, but even worse, how do we end up competing with very well-resourced science museums uh, and so on down the line of, of I know. And, and further, so, so how do we effectively partner with each other if we are all creating very similar overlapping titles uh, to a, a project? So what I'd really like for us to think about here is how we can create complementary experiences for one another where we can learn from each other and borrow from one another uh, and not replicate each other's work. So on that note, I think you know, I'll wrap it up and uh, we'll move on to the next. So thank you all for your time. Any questions? So we can move on to our last but not least, I always dream of saying this, presentation that 